Uh, so that was session one, introduction to Bitcoin, introduction to money. And today's session two then is going to be introduction to cryptography. Um, we'll be doing this a lot, putting these pieces together where we just look at a little bit of something and then try to map it into what a cryptocurrency is. So today's session is going to be all about cr cryptography. Now, because it's just one session, we can't really go into a ton of detail about cryptography. But I encourage you, if you're interested, you know, to dig into these concepts further. Uh, so question number one to get us started. So what I mean here is where is the crypto in cryptography? No, not cryptography. Crypto is right there in cryptography. Where is the crypto in cryptocurrency? That's what I mean here. So cryptographers or mathematicians will tell you that cryptocurrency came along and totally co-opted the term, you know? And it's like it, it ruined it. When, when something that you love blows up in the media or there's a meme about it, you're like, oh, it completely, completely ruined it. So now crypto by itself sort of refers to cryptocurrency, but it used to refer to cryptography. Um, so today we're going to answer this question, where is the crypto in cryptocurrency? Anyone have any premonitions or perhaps you do know where the crypto is? Security, se securities, security, yeah? Secure keys. Oh, absolutely, secure keys, yeah. So when we talk about keys in crypto, the keys themselves are cryptographic tools. Anything else? So the first thing we're going to look at is hash functions. These are a super common tool in all things computing, uh, you know, including in cryptocurrencies. We can think of hash functions as being able to fingerprint some data, some piece. Come on in, guys. Um, or loosely speaking, we can think of a hash function as being able to compress some data. So you can compress a large chunk of data or a large library or an entire system down to a single hash function. I say that term loosely, though. Uh, we're also going to look at Merkle trees as a technique for storing data, uh, which is also a cryptographic technique. And Merkle trees, as I just said, they're handy for storing data. We'll talk about why we need them in a blockchain. And we'll look at uh, we'll look at elliptic curves a little bit. We'll, lo we'll look sort of specifically kind of at what they are, scratching the surface, and we'll look at why they are secure. If we use, for example, elliptic curve digital signatures, you know, why is, you know, what's the property of this thing that makes it secure? Of what's the property that prevents people from being able to hack it? Remember the digital abundance problem says it's easy to copy and paste stuff. Data is really cheap. Data storage, super. it's only getting cheaper, right? Access to data, uh, you know, the marginal cost is effectively zero of making more data, right? You've never heard of YouTube limiting your uploads to, to create more data. Um, so in the context of money, we want to be able to have a money system where people can't just create more of it. And that's, of course, a key foundation principle. If you could create more of it, or if people, if somebody in the future can create more Bitcoin, right, it falls apart immediately. As soon as that becomes public, the whole system is broken. So, so you know, there must be something more to it than just trusting someone in this, right? There must be some math behind here. So we'll try to look at some of the motivation for that. Um, elliptic curves are used in address generation. So when you look at an address, uh, by an address, I mean a cryptocurrency address as a string of numbers and letters. And of course, digital signature is also very prominent used in computing, used in all types of systems, either in the foreground or the background that you don't even realize are happening. Um, you're signing, you know, your computer, your browser is signing certificates frequently. Okay, so the first chapter, if you will, is gonna be about hash functions. So what is a hash function? Well, it's, it's a one-way function. So you can create a hash, but you cannot undo it. You cannot uncreate it, you cannot go backwards. So my arrows here are going to the right, and I cannot go back to the left. And the hash function is going to randomly scramble the bits. That's it. So we're going to take some bits. So the example here, we'll take the string Jeff. We're going to run it through a hash function, SHA-256. And the function is going to output this long string. Well, it looks, it looks long. Uh, it turns out that it's just fixed length. So no matter what you do, 
you're going to get the same length of string. And when you look at the digits here, they should appear random when you look at the characters in these strings. So between the first and the second, I have changed from lowercase to capital J. And when you look at the second one, you might not be able to read it. It's a bit tiny to fit it all in, but you shouldn't find any pattern between the first one and the second one. So that's where the random comes in, right? Things that are random should not have a pattern to them. Uh, and at any time, so these are two contrasting concepts, random and pattern, right? Patterns, patterns are great for finding an advantage. Patterns are great for mathematicians looking um, for looking for a pattern, looking for some sort of you know, grand design to whatever they're studying. Randomness is great for computing. We really, really want to embrace randomness. We want to have good, hard randomness, especially in blockchains, because randomness, it's kind of indicative of there being a level playing field, fair play for everyone. If it's not random, meaning that you know, only um, the chosen few validators or the chosen few elites are allowed to make changes and benefit from the system, uh, then you know, the ordinary folks are not going to want to participate in that system. So we want to level the playing field. And in computing, we want to use random properties to help us do that. So very, very important. We want to have as, as, you know, almost as much randomness as we can cram in. And at, while at the same time, be wary that there could be patterns there. Because if there's a pattern, well, there could be a shortcut, there could be an arbitrage opportunity there, right? So if there's a pattern to some cryptography, there could be a way to break it or crack it um, that improves the efficiency uh, of that. So thus far, to our best of our knowledge, SHA-256 um, has not been cracked. So quick TO for a handout here. Uh, all right, so this is a published standard for the hash function. And you might want to look up a standard one day if you have to implement one of these, for example, um, or if you want to check something, or if you want to you know, uh, figure out how it works, you can look up one of these standards. So you know, completely public information here, August 2015, it was last updated. Uh, the secure hash standard, it includes a bunch of different families of functions. SHA-256 is kind of like the most common one that you hear of, but the 256 just means that that's the length, 256 bits in length. And the length that we saw right here for the strings Jeff and Jeff, that's in hexadecimal format, so it's 64 characters in length. But you could just as easily expand that into 256 bits of zeros or ones. Uh, you know, the family has all the way up to 512, so the hash would be twice as big. And, you know, so why wouldn't you just want to go to the biggest one possible? Well, you might not need that level of hashing security or randomness, and that might uh, um, affect your efficiency as well if you have a lot of hashes that you need to keep track of or in blockchain land if you're verifying a lot of things. So it was developed by the NIST, very high quality institution in America, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, and so, you know, this is where, like, if you're a crack cryptographer, this is one of the places you might go, you might go work or at your own country's version of this type of institute, right? There's not a lot of jobs out there for cryptographers. Um, on page, so I just printed out a few pages for you. I didn't print out the whole thing. On page five, we get an idea for the operations and symbols of how to read this thing. And then on page 10, it shows us um, part of the recipe for the SHA functions. So just an idea here of what we're looking at. So it reduces any piece of data down to 64 hex characters. 256 is the number of different places that we have, the number of different bits. And there's two options, a 0 or a 1 for each one. So some quick math here, 2 to 256 is this number in decimal form. So it's quite a big number. You know, it won't fit on a regular calculator, but you can, you know, you can use Wolfram Alpha to do it uh, or some other, some other computing system. So in decimal format, uh, and so that's telling us the number of different possibilities there are. 
So when you get into big numbers and computing and cryptography, it's very hard to conceptualize what it means. But essentially, big numbers are good because it's difficult to guess or to brute force by going through all of this many options. Scientific notation makes a little bit more palatable, 10 to the 77. And a quick look on Wikipedia tells me that 10 to the 77 compares kind of to the number of atoms in the universe. So there's about 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe. So 80, 79, 78, 77, that's 1,000 fewer um, different variations to the SHA-256 hash. So I mean, um, de depending on uh, your philosophy, that's comforting or that's not comforting, uh, that there's that many different variations to the SHA-256. And you could run the numbers bigger, right? SHA-512, 2 to the 512, right? It's not double. Every single exponent increase doubles it. So it's doubled another 256 times. Uh, and it's that much bigger, you know, well past the number of atoms in the universe, that, that type of size. Um, and again, the size, well, why, why do we care about how big it is? Well, maybe you don't want somebody to random guess your hash. That could be a problem. Okay, the details I'm talking about here on page 10, this is kind of like the recipe. So a hash function is going to take your data, and then it's going to go you know, sort of block by block, or it's going to chunk it into sections, and it's going to go section by section, and it's going to scramble the bits. Once we scramble the bits, we don't want, it's a one-way function, we don't want you to be able to unscramble them, right? You can only break an egg uh, and, and make scrambled eggs with it. You can't go the other direction. Um, but how can you scramble it in a deterministic way, meaning that the next time you do it, you get the same result? So we have to follow an algorithm or a recipe. And, you know, there's not a lot, there's not really a lot happening here when you dig into it. So we have ROTR, which is rotate right. And we have shift right, SHR, okay? So we're either rotating or we're shifting. And then we're putting the bits together with the XOR here. So rotating our bits means we have our string and we're going to rotate them to the right. And when we rotate them to the right, we're going to have some spillover. So if I rotate these bits here to the right, then my new output, here I have a zero down the end. And so the rotate says, well, we're just going to bring that back around to the front. Now, since you know in binary here, this represents a number, by the time you do this, you get a completely different value. So you've lost the link to the original one, except you could undo it. You could undo the rotate, okay, and, and get it back. So we don't want that to happen. So the other operation is, well, the XOR and then the shift, SHR. So the shift says, if we're shifting it, then we're just going to end up with an empty slot. So I would have one, 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 zero, one, one, So the shift would end up with an empty slot here, and we'll just zero it. So if we shift all the way, then we end up with zero. And it's kind of like deleting your information. There's nothing. There's no more signal there. All of the bits are gone. So by the time we combine the rotate and the shift and the XOR, there's enough ambiguity that you can't undo and recover the information. OK, so the XOR gate is kind of like the the keystone here. So this is exclusive or, and we can see if we have A and B, different options here. There's four options of two bits, two to the two. Anytime that a one shows up by itself, exclusively, the output is a one. Otherwise, the output is a zero. Okay, and it's this nature that we combine all of the bits with. So. There's kind of really only those three operations there. So I think the point I'm trying to convey here 
is that it's actually not that difficult secondhand, once we know how it works, to see it and to implement it and to do it and to get an idea of, of the hash function. The tricky part here actually, if you're into this stuff, the tricky part isn't, you can like get creative in how you scramble your bits, but the tricky part is how do you do it so that it is reliably random when you're done? And that's almost something that you don't know until after the fact. You know, you don't know you've written a masterpiece until 20 years later when they give you an award and they say, hey, it turned out that that was really great. So where does the hash function shows up? We already saw this slide. It shows up in our linked timestamping. So we take a whole document. The document can be any size. It could be the size of a newspaper, right? It could be the size of a paragraph of text or a, or a tweet or a post or something. You put it through the hash function, you get a fixed length output, and then you store it. In this case, it's being stored on the newspaper. Somebody's gonna archive this and maybe later come back and use it. In the case of a blockchain, exactly the same thing. We're gonna archive all of those hashes. And then some point in the future, you might need to come back to it, you might not, but if you do, it's there. And this is turning into a whole um, sector, a whole business where people archive blockchains and then you know, basically give you an API access to that data so that you don't have to do it yourself. And then, the next iteration later, we'll do the same thing. We've got some new document that wants to be archived, hash function, write it here. And by the time you get to, you know, maybe this is present day, by the time you get there, this hash has been updated for all the previous five days. And that means that the output of today's one includes the input of all the previous day's ones. So individual hashes can be good for kind of this uh, lo-fi compression, you get a nice efficient output. If you build a chain over time, then you're starting to create a system that can be trusted because it takes a lot of work to go back and alter the document or the hash. So if you wanna go back in time, you know maybe this was where you earned your diploma, you wanna go back in time and alter the date on that document, right? You wanna backdate something for whatever reason, you know, for fun or for tax evasion purposes. So you go and you create the document, but then you need to get it into the system. You get that hash into the system. As soon as you change the bits of the document, so you update the year or the timestamp, the hash is different. And from this point forward, it breaks all of the subsequent hashes. And that's, you know, that's okay, except if somebody wants to verify it. So when someone comes along and says, let's check on Jeff's diploma, uh, and then they see that oh, actually at this, at this point, um, you know, the history was altered. And so it becomes this nice system of checks and balances. And it's part of like a self-fulfilling prophecy where at first it doesn't mean much, but over time, you now have all the history behind it as well that's adding its weight to it. Okay, so this is in a chain of blocks. The data that we're gonna store here is gonna be a bunch of hashes and we'll see that. And by including the hash of the previous one in the current one, and then the orange one in the black one, and then this one in the next one and the next one, then you're building that chain of trust or you're building that uh, history going back to the beginning. So I think in the future, it's gonna be something where you look at the blockchain and part of the value comes from how long it's been alive. How long has the chain been around? How long, how far back can you trace that history? Uh, and I think in tech, they call this, you know, the first mover advantage. The first product with a good new idea that works is going to gain tremendous advantage over the others. And that's the advantage that Bitcoin has. Okay, so where else do we see hashing? So we saw this one before as well of a recent block. And we can see all of these sections I've highlighted, they're all hashes. So quite common and not just in blockchains and all, all of computing, these are all hashes. So on this highlighted, on these highlighted boxes here, what do you notice about these hashes? So we see it down here too, right? Previous block hash, next block hash. A large number of leading zeros. And I just spent 10 minutes banging on about how randomness is really important and we don't want there to be any pattern. So certainly in the one I've highlighted here, 
a very obvious pattern. Clearly, we have zero bits up front. OK? We'll come back to talk about this next week with proof of work. But to your point, these are real hashes. And it's a random occurrence that we happen to see all the zeros out in front. It's like when someone says to you, like, they see a number, and they're like, oh, look at that. It's, uh, it's my brother's birthday. Like, like look at that. We, you know, we were destined to win uh, because uh, it was written in the numbers, right? Well, you know, your brother's birthday has the same probability of coming up in a random system as does my birthday, as does your mother's birthday, as does a completely organized and apparently zeroed out um, sequence of bits. So in terms of probability, when we see the leading zeros, it's really stark and it stands out. But the probability from the random number process in the SHA-256, the probability should be the same as any other input string. But what we're going to do for blockchains is we're going to look at this and we're going to pull it out and we're going to say, I know that your probability was equal to something else, but we're going to keep you because you're important. And so that's why it shows up here as stored. Now the data doesn't adhere to this. I, to this process, right? The data is more of a looks more random, even though they are, uh, you know, statistically the same. Okay, so hash functions, very important. They come up a lot. The takeaway is that we want a hash function that we can trust, that we know has been around, such that you can't find any patterns in it. You know, there's no way to unbreak that egg once you hash something. It's quick to verify in the future. All you have to do is hash on your own and then check to the published hash. But you cannot start with the published hash and figure out the input data. So I cannot start with a published hash and figure out the block that went into it. What I have to do is have the block to start and then do a comparison. So this is what we talk about when we say uh, that you have to verify things for yourself. Up next, we have a brief explainer of Merkle trees as a data structure.